So let's look at the classic example now of a sea factory. This is the Euclid shelf and this is work done by Noel James um, in the 90s. And basically what he suggests is that in sea factory, because we lack mud and we lack early cement, we lack the ability to really um, litify the lithologies soon, soon after deposition. So that leads to a system where the sediments are basically deposited, but also eroded, just like you would in clastic. So low stand are characterized on this system by erosion and transport of the, of the previous high stand carbonates. And so what you have at low stand is a sedimentation that comprise in the basin both allochthonous sediments that were transported and autochthonous formation of sediments in the basin. During the transgression and the regression, what happened is the wave can abrade the sediment, so it can actually erode the sediments where we have high wave energy, but otherwise we can have deposition of, again, autochthonous and allochthonous sediments on the shelf itself. And during high stand, again, we have you know, a little bit of abrasion where the wave base exists, but we also have a lot of autochthonous sedimentation on top of that shelf. So that leads to something that Noel James calls the shaved shelves, because this shelf basically loses all of its sediments during low stands. We can recognize those eustatic cycle when we look at the, the cyclicity within the sediment. So you've seen the bed form in the cliffs behind me. Now if we look at cores, we see the same kind of cyclicity that indicates essentially that we have coarsening upward cycle that represent cycles of infilling of accommodation. So bed form in this type of uh, setting is very useful and important in recognizing the, um, the different system tract. And of course, those system tract look different, whether you are in the more distal part of the system or the more proximal part of the system. In the distal part of the system, you will, you will end up with bryozoan packstone, waxstone, even mudstone. If you're very proximal, you'll end up with more cross-bedded grainstone, some hard ground where you have no, no deposition, and maybe some biturbated packstone, hard ground, and storm deposits. So in terms of geometry for the C factory, if you compare it to the T factory, it's actually quite different. Um, the the C factory, again, because it lacks mud and the ability to be cemented early, will end up acting very much like clastic, very similar to clastic. And if you look here at the Euclid shelf, we see that we have mostly C factory deposits and they, they form those broad clinoformal geometry, except for sequence 6b, where you can see very clearly some steep-sided geometry and, a, and an important stacking pattern. And it is thought that this sequence 6b that's never been drilled is actually a T factory sequence where water temperature were much higher. What happens on the Euclid shelf is you have cold water coming from Antarctica. This is why it's so cold on this shelf and why autotrophs don't really form here. So, so that explains the um, presence of the C factory on this shelf. And that can be seen in our model as well. You can see at the top that when we have the C factory, we don't have a lot of sediment, but we also have relatively gentle geometry filling the basin, so more like clinoformal geometry with, with very low angle, whereas when we have the orange, yellow, and green deposits, which are the T factory in our um, diffusion-based model, we see we have much steeper geometries thanks to the fact that they can cement quickly. And we model this in the, in the software by having different diffusion coefficient for these different types of sediment. So the C factories are not very common as reservoir, but there's one exception, and that's of course in Brazil. So in Brazil, in the Campos Basin, what happened is you had the opening of the South Atlantic that was isolated from the rest of the ocean. So you end up with essentially a giant alkali lake in the lower Cretaceous. And during the Sinrift, sequence of that um, deposit. You have the Baravea formation that is, that is formed. And you can see it here in the Sinrift. We have those, uh, those carbonates. And 
these carbonates are actually skeletal components. They're effectively beach facies. That's one of the types of uh, reservoir that you find in the Sinrift. And these beach facies are made up of fragments of mostly bivalves and gastropods. And so this is a typical sea factory. And in this case, I think we have a sea factory not because necessarily of water temperature, but more because of alkalinity that was detrimental for the carbonate producers of the time, so the rudists or even the corals. So that's why we end up with a sea factory. So it's a different type of stressed environment, but it is a stressed environment nevertheless. And it's really the only oil and gas reservoir in a sea factory type of deposits that I can think about. Now, one thing uh, to keep in mind is that because this was a lake, you had a, a relatively shallow water, so about 100 meters, 150 meters, and those coquinas were deposited at the edge of that lake, and you had behind them maybe some gastropod and some micrite with halite uh, on the, uh, on the uh, surface. So a very different type of deposition than we would normally encounter in the ocean, but in some ways similar uh, as well. Well, when people think about Brazil, they think about the microbiolite. So um, because I brought up Brazil, I thought I'd mention those um, as well. So here you have a seismic profile of the Brazilian margin. And now we are in the SAG phase, no longer the Sinrift phase. And in the SAG phase, you do indeed see those beautiful uh, pinnacle shaped um, uh, reflector here. And these could very well be microbial deposits. There are some evidence for microbial deposits, but there is also a counter theory by Paul Wright that thinks that these are actually tufa, so chemical sediments and not biological sediments. And given that we are in hyperalkali condition, it is quite possible, as you know from your chemistry now, to deposit carbonate because they will be super saturated. So there's the possibility that the, or at least part of those microbialite deposits in Brazil are not microbialite at all, but in the, instead are actually shrubs that nucleate and are deposited completely abiotically because of the complex alkali chemistry of those lakes. And that's at least the theory from, uh, from Paul Wright. So that's why I don't use Brazil as my typical example for the M factory, because I think there is a, a little bit of a question mark on this one. And that now brings me to the conclusion for the C factory sequence stratigraphy and also for the second part of this course. So we've discussed that the C factory actually forms where the water temperature is too cold for the T producers to kick in. So that's why they're called cool water carbonates. And that's why in New Zealand, in the cold frigid water offshore from New Zealand, the carbonates we have in the Cenozoic are C factory type and not T factory type. That makes sense. Another important aspect of C carbonate is that they don't have the ability to cement and there's also no micrite. So that means that they are similar to clastic in their sequence stratigraphic response. But there is one difference. The one difference is that you can have otogenic production of carbonates in the basin. You can have C factory carbonate produ production. You can also have some reef. It's possible to have small bioherms, even of corals, if the conditions are marginal, but okay for them to grow. So that's not something that you would find in plastic. So that's a slight difference. Because the production of C factory organism is relatively slow and relatively low compared to T factory, those um, factories are actually not as abundant, not as frequent, and certainly don't form such a large volume of sediment as the T factory. So that's why we tend to focus on T factory carbonates much more. But there are a few known reservoirs, and I've mentioned the Sin Reef sequence of Brazil, which is, in my opinion, the best um, example for a C factory reservoir. So that's it for the depositional environment of carbonate and their sequence stratigraphy. What we have to study now is the diagenesis of carbonates, what happens after they die. And this is what we're going to do in our next class.